Okay, guys, welcome to the last lecture of our course, Physics 137. And it has been a huge sprint um, for everyone. Um, so I just want to start the class by saying, uh, same thing I said at the end of yesterday's class, uh, huge congratulations. If you're still, if you're still with us, um, that alone like, warrants a, a huge amount of praise uh, on, on for you guys, because that's an accelerated course is not easy, especially when you're, you know, an accelerated physics course. There's a huge amount of math and physics and, you know, taking, taking a first year calculus class alone is a lot of work and we're, we're pretty much having to dance around the math as well as do the physics. So it's almost like we have one and a half or two courses in one course and it's accelerated. So um, that is no small uh, feat of accomplishment, even making it to the end, regardless of what grades you're, you're getting or not getting. It's just a huge, huge accomplishment to, to have made it to the end. And uh, everyone who has, has just immediately has my respect. So congratulations on making it to the end. Um, I will take questions later in this lecture. Uh, for anyone who has got course related questions, it could be from past exams, it could be from uh, past midterms, it could be just homework questions or clarification questions, uh, anything, anything you guys really have. Um, but before I do that, I want to spend uh, maybe half an hour or so, and I just I, I put together some slides um, from earlier in the class. Now, we just covered optics, so optics is relatively new. Uh, newly taught for everyone, so it's more fresh in your heads. But it's been a while since we sort of reviewed Gauss's law. You know that happened whew, way back, and in July. I know it doesn't even feel like that long ago, but we've covered a lot of material since then. So I've put together some sort of summary slides of uh, of of the the beginning part of the course, and uh, we'll just quickly go through those. Just sort of refresh your brain, give yourself a story again. You know the narrative, the plot line beginning, middle, and end, and hopefully it kind of jogs your memory on some of the more specific details that we've, that we've covered. Uh, okay, and now it's not scrolling. Again, welcome to Windows. Okay, there we go. Okay, so um, we started our talk with what a, um, way back in July, we started the course with what a conductor is. Uh, so we, we looked at, uh, oh, Oh yeah, thank you, Rodrigo, for that. So um, right before I jump in, small piece of administrative announcement. Um, I pushed back the due date for assignment four to Monday. And I think, I, think the, uh, um, I think the schedule says it's due either Friday or Saturday. I can't remember which day. But um, the, what I'm allowed to do is I'm not allowed to have anything due during the study week. UTM is very, or U of T actually, is very particular about that. They don't want due dates in the study week because that week is supposed to be designed for students to study. So I'm not able to push it back any, any more than Monday the 17th, but since Monday is labeled as the last day of lectures, uh, I am able to make it due on the Monday. So it will be due on the Monday, giving you guys uh, as much time as possible to, to solve that, uh, that assignment. Okay, um, anyway, so thank, thanks for reminding me about that, I forgot. Um, okay, back to the review. So we started our talk way back in July with talking about uh, what a charge is and, uh, and, and different materials that will allow charge to flow easily or not easily. So we call those conductors and insulators. And you'll remember perhaps that the conclusion of this is that um, although we use the terminology conductor and insulator, it's a sort of a spectrum, it's a continuum. And anything can really be made into a conductor. So like air, for instance, is the most common one that you, you might experience in day-to-day -day life with lightning. You know, you can get a spark across air. Air is not normally considered to be a conductor, but with enough voltage, which we call the breakdown voltage, you can actually push uh, a charge through air acting as a conductor. And we quantify these by calling, uh, by using the quantities rho and sigma. So rho is the resistivity and sigma is the conductivity. And this is a measure of how conductive something is or, or how resistive a material is. And the relationship between rho and sigma is uh, simply inverses. 
of one another. They're just reciprocals of one another. So um, yes, you know, in colloquial terminology, we can call something a conductor or an insulator, but in physics, um, instead of labeling them as conductor or insulator, we, we usually um, we usually just use their resistivity or their conductivity value. Uh, we also talked about, you know, that we know that charges exist. We talked about, well, how do we obtain charged objects? Well, there are three mechanisms in which we can obtain charged objects. There's rubbing uh, or, or, or friction. And this is, you know, with your laundry as it tumbles in the dryer. This is when you're sitting in your car and you get out of your car and you shock yourself, you know, because there's rubbing between your shirt and the, and the fabric of the seat. Uh, or you may have seen the demonstration where you rub the balloon on your hair. Like these are all examples of rubbing or friction. Uh, there's induction or, or charge separation. Uh, as you know, induction now has a different meaning. It's Faraday's law. So perhaps we should be calling it charge separation, where you can induce a dipole in an object and then ground it on one side and, and force the, the, um, the charge off. And then the third way to achieve a charged object is conduction, where you, you touch. And when you touch two objects together, they share charges equally. So, um, you know, you pretty much just average the charge and each, each of the two objects touching uh, has half of the charge. From there, we went to the notion of, it, of acknowledging that, hey, we know what charges are, we know how to create charged objects and all this stuff. Um, we know how to transfer objects with a conductor. Um, but we also noticed that these, these charges exert a force, an invisible force on each other. And uh, as a scientist, that's, that's really our job is, is to quantify that. So then we moved into trying to quantify that force. Okay, there's, a, there's an electric force, but what's its formula? What are the variables that go into it? And um, uh, we very quickly realized it's not an easy thing because the amount of force depends on the situation. Um, oh, I just kicked the camera, so it's probably vibrating. Um, so it, it depends whether you have two point sources, it depends on whether you have a sheet of charge or a rod of charge. And that really threw us for a loop for uh, us meaning physicists for uh, quite a while, because you know, with, with the other forces, they were a very definite form of even gravity, GMM over R squared, that was the celestial Newton's law of gravity. Near the Earth's surface, it was just MG. Um, it wasn't situation specific. Whereas with electric forces, they were situation specific. So it was really difficult for us to sort of figure out exactly the big picture of what's going on. So we then leaned, we invented a new, uh, a, a new well, field of physics, which is within itself a field, um, field theory. We leaned on field theory and we invented um, the, an idea of an electric field. And an electric field does not, it does not exist. It's, it's a mathematical construct that we use to help with our analysis. And we said that the natural force, a natural force uh, is equal to the intrinsic property uh, of, of that field times the field itself. And we've seen this sort of pattern before. Um, there's only four natural forces that really exist. There's gravity, um, there's the electric force, the magnetic force, and then the strong and weak nuclear forces. So those are like the, the four main uh, natural forces. But each of the four natural forces follow this sort of force field pairing relationship. So with gravity, we saw Fg equals the intrinsic property of gravity would be the mass of the object and then the gravitational field, G. And if you're close to the Earth's surface, G is 9.8. Um, if you're far away from the Earth's surface, G is gonna be, or little g is gonna be capital G times the mass uh, over R squared. So, you know, sometimes the gravitational field is a constant, like in and around the Earth's surface, and sometimes it's a variable, which is more traditional. Um, we also saw this with this, uh, with the electric field as well. Um, the uh, intrinsic property of the electric field is charge and then times the electric field E. And later in the class, we also saw this with the magnetic field. Uh, the intrinsic property of the magnetic field was a moving charge, so Q times V, and then we multiplied it by the magnetic field. So we saw this sort of force field pairing creep up um, before. So if you actually think about it, uh, four, uh, three of the four natural forces 
uh, we've, we've studied in this introductory class. The only ones we haven't studied is the strong and weak nuclear forces, which uh, if you think about it, is quite amazing. Like, like three of the four fundamental forces of nature we've covered. So that's, that's kind of cool. Um, without delving any deeper into the electric field, just using F equals QE alone, um, we were able to piggyback with F equals QE, we were able to piggyback that with F equals MA, and we were able to deduce some pretty cool things uh, in the realm of electricity. So one thing we were able to deduce is something called a Faraday cage, and that pretty much means that in the static case where there's no flow of charge and there's no current flowing through a conductor, uh, in the case of static, then there's no electric field inside of a conductor. And this is because the external electric field will separate, will separate the charge and the conductor, and thus it will produce uh, a reverse E field to counteract the E field that's external, that's being applied from outside. And uh, the net result inside is zero. So that's called a Faraday cage, and we've talked a lot about a Faraday cage, and uh, because there's no E field inside a Faraday cage, um, external uh, factors, uh, electromagnetic factors, cannot penetrate inside of a Faraday cage, which is really cool. So that means, you know, things like, um, you know, cell phone signals, if you put your cell phone in the microwave, please do not turn on your microwave, but if you put your cell phone in the microwave and close the door, um, it won't receive any signal. And uh, I mean, that's something you can try yourself. You have those, um, those protectors for your credit cards, those little sleeves, and you might be thinking, well, how does, a, how does a plastic sleeve protect your tap on your credit card? Well, tap is an electromagnetic induction from Faraday's law. We've talked about that. And uh, in the plastic sleeve, it's not totally plastic. There's a wire mesh in the sleeve, um, and that acts as a Faraday cage. And um, you, know, you could even use a Faraday cage to, to protect yourself from harm as well. I mean, most people aren't standing in and around a Tesla coil. But if you were, you, you know, a Tesla coil could shoot the Faraday cage and you'd be safe inside. Um, you may have heard the saying in a lightning storm, you know, you go, you know, you'll be safe in your car, safer in your car even than in your house. And the reason for that, uh, a lot of people think, oh, it's because of the rubber tires in the car. No, 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 no. Lightning jumps from the clouds all the way to the ground. Um, that is like six, six to ten kilometers of, of air gap. If lightning has enough voltage to jump through six to 10 kilometers of air, you think a few inches of rubber is going to stop it? No, 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 no. That, that's demonstrably false. Um, the reason you're safe in a car is because the car is a Faraday cage. It's a metal car. And it, if, if lightning were to hit the car, then um, you'd be safe in the car because it's a Faraday cage. That the lightning would strike the cage, go around the cage, um, go around the car. Um, through the tires, through the rubber, and into the ground, and you'd be safe inside. So um, we talked about Faraday cages. Then we moved on to Maxwell's equations, and we said, okay, enough is enough. So let's actually get down to business. Um, there are four laws or four equations in the realm of electromagnetism that govern this entire field. Um, Gauss's law was for electrostatics. Gauss's law for magnetism was for magnetostatics. And then together, Faraday's law and Ampere's law together govern the realm of electromagnetodynamics, motion. And um, we can sort of pretend to separate them, you know, where we talk about electrodynamics and magnetodynamics separately. But right at the last chapter of this class, we talked about electromagnetic waves. And we learned that um, in general, if, they're, if, they're, if the electric field or the magnetic field is changing, non-uniformly, then they have to be coupled together. You can't get one without the other one. Um, however, you can temporarily separate them in the event that they are changing uniformly. You know, if the derivative, um, you can't really see the blue, if the derivative is a constant, you know, like if, if the changing B field is uniformly increasing, then that means like the B field is analogous to Y equals MX plus B. And then the derivative would then be the slope m. So if the derivative is a constant, then yes, you can sort of separate uh, the realm of electrodynamics and magnetodynamics. That's a very niche, very specific situation. 
Um, just a reminder, I have a black cat. I think he appeared in one of the videos. He was sitting beside me yelling at me one of the lectures. And, uh, you know, I named him Max after James Clerk Maxwell. So um, just to illustrate how prevalent and important Maxwell's equations are. Uh, we moved into talking about Gauss's law. So we talked about the fact that, yes, um, this is vector calculus and it's complicated and, and you know, it's, it's difficult to do in all of its glory. Um, so we, we talked about sort of ideal, ideal situations and the ideal situations, of course, are not necessarily indicative of real life, but they're good enough for our class. So we said, okay, in an ideal situation, we had three assumptions. We said, um, assume that the E field is constant along the entire surface uh, of our Gaussian surface. So if the E field is constant uh, at every x, y, z that we're integrating over, then as far as math is concerned, you can factor out a constant from the integral. Um, so then this allowed us to do E times the integral of dA cos theta. And then assumption two, we said assume that the theta value between the E field and the, the area is constant. Um, and again, this is, this is not true for every Gaussian surface. You have to be very specific and choosy with what surface you pick to make these assumptions happen. And if this is true, then you can also factor out the, the theta dependence. And then you get E cos theta times the integral of dA. And then of course, the third assumption is where we're having to integrate dA and we know the integral of dA, it's just A in the same way that the integral of dx is just X. Um, so the third assumption is that we in fact know a formula for area. And assuming we know the formula for the area of the, of the uh, surface we picked, then we're golden. So that's how we came about obtaining uh, this equation here, Ea cos theta was, was with those three um, assumptions. And we use that for Coulomb's law. So we sketched, we sketched the E field for uh, a point charge and the E field is uh, spherically symmetric and points radially outward. So we had to pick a Gaussian surface that you know, made the E field constant everywhere along the surface, made the angle constant everywhere along the surface, and, and, and the surface itself that we knew the formula for. So the, the answer to those three assumptions in this case was a sphere. So you'll notice that we have the same uh, angle everywhere along the surface. And um, again, we don't know what the E field is, but you know, at every point along the surface, because of its symmetry, because the E field is, is symmetric, uh, circularly or spherically symmetric, then um, anywhere along the, the blue Gaussian surface, I'm the same R value, the same radial distance away from the source. So that means I'm going to have the same value as my neighbors. So that's, that's uh, assumption one taken care of, assumption two taken care of, and assumption three, do we know the formula for the surface area of a sphere? Yes, we do, it's four pi r squared. So all three assumptions are satisfied, and then we are then able to use Gauss's law to obtain the E field, and we couple that with F equals QE. Once we have the E field, we multiply by um, a second charge Q, and then we can obtain the force. So this is where Coulomb's law comes from. And a, a reminder, a bit of a warning, textbooks do not, historically do not explain where Coulomb's law comes from. So even if you're doing a review from your textbook, um, you'll notice that Coulomb's law is in fact taught before Gauss's law. And I think that is probably one of the biggest disservices textbooks do for students, is they say, proof by trust me. Here's Coulomb's law, believe me, it's true. Uh, let's move on, then we're gonna do Gauss's law. And for me, that order just doesn't make sense. So just word of caution there if you're doing some review. Uh, we moved on to a parallel plate capacitor. Uh, again, it's a different scenario. We already know that in, in the realm of electricity, the scenario is very important. So we have a new scenario. We've got a new electric force, and we were able to use Coul uh, not Coulomb's law, um, Gauss's law again to obtain uh, the electric field inside of a parallel plate capacitor. And it turned out that it was a constant 
So the electric field inside of a parallel plate capacitor was Q over epsilon naught A, which was obtained, obtained again from Gauss's law. And um, once we know that it's a constant E field, we know that, and, and oh, let me just say constant, we know it's a constant E field. So if it's a constant E field, F equals QE, which means it's gonna be a constant force. And if it's a constant force, talking about the energy associated with it is relatively easy because when you have a constant force, the work done due to a constant force is simply uh, force times displacement, which is, uh, easier to do than, 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 than the integral equivalent when you have a variable force. And we know force, force is QE. So the work done to move a charge within a parallel plate capacitor is simply QED. Um, and if you remember grade 11 math, that is also Latin for the end of a, of a mathematical derivation. So it's a funny, stupid little math joke there. Um, we then moved on to voltage. We talked about voltage and uh, how there is no such thing as absolute voltage because it's very analogous to electrical potential energy. And because um, really all, all voltage is, is the electrical potential energy. Let me maybe switch to red. Is electrical potential energy divided by Q. And so Electrical potential energy is directly anal uh, analogous to gravitational potential energy in that when you raise an object up and you drop it, it will naturally flow to a lower, to a lower gravitational potential. That happened with electricity as well. A proton or a positive charge will spontaneously travel to a lower potential in the same way when you drop an object, it travels down. So the question though is with gravitational potential energy, there is no such thing as an absolute gravitational potential energy. It's always relative to a, a certain frame of reference. Um, if you hold your very expensive thousand dollar smartphone um, on the side of, of a railing at the top of your stairs, you might get nervous because it has the potential to fall. However, um, take, take a table, for instance. If you, if you put your phone at the edge of a table, again, you might get nervous because it, it it looks like convinces your brain at the edge of the table it has the potential to fall. So your brain's like, yes, it has potential energy. But if you slide your phone into the center of the table, your brain is much more relaxed. You're not worried about your thousand dollar smartphone anymore because your brain's like, yeah, there's no way it's gonna fall. I could nudge it, I could bump it, it's not gonna fall. So your brain is tricked into thinking that at the center of the table, it has no gravitational potential energy. But that's not true. All your brain has done is it switched its frame of reference from the ground to the table. So the same is true with electricity. Um, you can't really talk about voltage. You can only really talk about the voltage difference or the potential difference between two points. Um, we then were able to derive a new or a different expression for the electric field inside of a parallel plate capacitor. Um, the electric field is equal to the change in voltage across the two plates divided by the plate separation, uh, D. So E equals delta V over D. And it's not that one is true and the other is false because we, we had previously derived this equation from Gauss's law. And it's not that one's true and one's not true. They are both simultaneously true. Um, it's just a function of whether you have knowledge of charge and area or if you don't have knowledge of charge and area, maybe you have knowledge of the voltage from like the nine volt battery you're using and the, the distance between the plates. It's just a question of what you have and what you need. And because these two are equivalent, you can actually set them equal to each other and you can, you can then see, uh, well, <laughs> you can see what C is, capacitance. So this is a, a new idea that we get from capacitance. And all we did here was we set these two equal to each other. So we got delta V over D equals to Q over epsilon naught A. And uh, when, we, when we solve for Q, we're gonna get Q equals epsilon naught A over D times delta V. And you see here that this is what we labeled to be the capacitance. So this is where we get Q equals CV from. It was from that previous um, double formula. And then we get the capacitance to be this. And the capacitance is a measure of how much charge a parallel plate capacitor can hold. 
and we see that there are sort of three variables in there. Um, there's the area of the plates, the larger the plates, the more charge you can hold. Um, there's the separation of the two plates, so the closer they are together, the more charge they can hold. And then there is the, the epsilon value. So if it's air filled, it's epsilon naught. Um, if it's a dielectric, if you slip in like a, a, a dielectric piece of material in there, that has a different epsilon value. Then if you increase epsilon, you can also increase how much charge is um, uh, that the parallel plate capacitor can hold. Now the parallel plate capacitor, because it can hold charge, uh, it does act like a battery of sorts. So this means uh, it can store energy because if it can act like a battery, then in the event there isn't another battery, um, it can temporarily, until it's used up, um, dispel its charge back into the circuit and power some things temporarily. So um, the energy stored in a capacitor uh, has three different equations. Uh, so we use the equation Q equals, oops, Q equals CV uh, in conjunction with one of the three of these. So let's say we start with the equation one half C uh, V squared. Um, we can say this is like the base equation, if you, if you will, for the energy in a capacitor. Uh, you can use these two equations in conjunction to obtain three rearrangements. And they're all equivalent. It's just a question, again, a question of what you have and what you need. You pick whichever one is, um, is most useful for you. Uh, then we moved on to circuits, so the motion of charge. We are then moving away from uh, electrostatics and we're moving into electrodynamics, so the movement of charge. And uh, we then start talking about current. So there has to be a relationship between um, the potential difference in between two places in a wire, which will obviously cause charges to move. We've already talked about that. And um, so there has to be a relationship between the thing that causes the movement to the current, the current being how much movement there is. Is there a small amount of current, meaning there's a small amount of movement, or is there a large current, a large amount of movement? And that relationship is actually called Ohm's loss. And, and the coupling factor is the resistance. Um, you can think of it pretty much like F net equals MA with friction. You know, if you push with 10 newtons, if there's no friction, then you get the maximum acceleration. But if you push with 10 newtons and there's nine newtons of friction, then you're going to get one newton's worth of acceleration, right? So that's pretty much what, what Ohm's law is saying, is if you have a certain force, um, how much acceleration are you going to get? And that's a function of the friction. So that's, that's what Ohm's law is talking about. Um, the resistance is um, a function of three things. It's a function of material. Um, copper is inherently more conductive than, say, aluminum, uh, and especially more conductive than, say, wood. And so that's, that's encapsulated by the resistivity. So that's a sort of a throwback to earlier in the lecture here. The other uh, factor that goes into the total resistance of a, of a material is the length of the material. So the longer, the longer the, the current has to travel along the wire, the longer the wire, the more resistance it's going to be. You can think of this like, you know, pipes in your house uh, or a garden hose. You know, the longer the garden hose, you get some really crappy water pressure at the end of the garden hose because it, it loses a lot of oomph for, or pressure head um, due to friction along the hose. And then the other thing for resistance uh, is the cross-sectional area. So the smaller the area, you are forcing all of the electrons to travel in only one or two lanes of traffic versus the same number of electrons traveling in six lanes of traffic. And that's pretty much what's happening right now with the 401 in Mississauga. Uh, right now there's three lanes uh, on the 401 uh, through Mississauga and it's always backed up. You know, you could be traveling and you hit Winston Churchill, as soon as you hit Winston Churchill, it just gridlocked all the way to here, Ontario. And as soon as you pass here, Ontario, it opens up again for some magical reason. I don't know why. Mississauga is weird like that. And right now they're, they're expanding those three lanes into six lanes because they're increasing the cross-sectional area. So they're going to decrease the resistance of that road. So that's the main idea there. Uh, then we moved into talking about electrical power. So the definition of electrical power is P equals IV, but we can couple this notion or this equation with Ohm's law of equals IR and we can actually get two other rearrangements of electrical power. Again, it's a function of what you have and what you need. 
Then we talked about combining components of a circuit. So there are two main components in a circuit. There's either a resistor or, or a capacitor. Um, so there's two ways to combine resistors. There's series and parallel. So those are the formulas for those. Um, then we acknowledge when they have more than one battery, um, sometimes things are neither. They're neither series nor parallel. And in which case, how do you analyze the circuit? So then we talked about Kirchhoff's laws and Kirchhoff's laws, there were two of them. One was loop rule, the other was junction rule. Loop rule said whatever goes up must come down. Um, so whatever voltage gains uh, a, a charge has going through a closed loop, any closed loop in a circuit, um, they must use all of that voltage as they go around the circuit. And that will help you sort of determine uh, the, the current in each wire segment, the voltage difference of each component and pretty much help you solve the circuit. Uh, another Kir uh, Kirchhoff's law is junction rule. This is a, a fundamentally conservation of energy or conservation of charge. And the idea here is what goes in comes out. Um, if you have a certain amount of current that goes into a junction and it splits, then um, the, the total current I has to equal I1 plus I2 uh, and I3. What goes in must come out. And the reverse is true. Here you have current one coming in, current two coming in, and current three coming in, and that they all combine again to current I. So, you know, what goes in must come out. Then the last piece of knowledge we talked about in this chapter was RC circuits, where you have a capacitor as well as a resistor being charged with a battery. And we talked about, you know, when the, when the capacitor is initially not charged, then a lot of current flows out of the battery because it's trying to build up charge on, on this empty plate. And uh, as charge builds up on the plates, then the current out of the battery slows down. So we get this sort of negative exponential. Um, the voltage across the capacitor builds up slowly with time. <clears throat> and the current out of the battery uh, is a negative exponential. It decreases with time. And it should be uh, illustrated or, or emphasized that <clears throat> this is the current out of the battery and that with proper operation of a capacitor, there is no charge that ever flows through a capacitor, right? It's supposed to be an air gap. So although there's current flowing out of the battery because it's having to supply the charges building up on the plates of the capacitor, um, there, is no char or there is no current through the entire circuit because it is not a closed circuit. The capacitor is physically an air gap, so it's a physical break in the circuit. Then we moved into magnetism. So the second of Gauss's, uh, sorry, the second of Maxwell's equations is Gauss's law for magnetism. And um, Gauss's law, if you recall, was EDA equals Q over epsilon naught. And uh, this was an interesting equation because the right hand side of the equation was non-zero. So this allowed us to actually solve for different scenarios. However, for, magne uh, for magnetostatics, the right hand side is equal to zero. So it's a very boring equation. There, there are very few solutions where the answer just gets to zero. So it, that naturally gives you uh, a very simpler scenario. And really all this says is that the magnetic field lines have to loop around back home. Uh, and electric field lines could spread out for infinity, like radially outwards, or in the event you had a positive and a negative, they could uh, start at the plus and then terminate at the negative. Um, you know, there's a definite beginning and a definite end. But with magnetism, there is no beginning and there is no end. It's just a constant circle. Then we moved into Ampere's law, which is a third of Maxwell's, e well, the third equation of Maxwell's equations. And, um, Ampere's law told us that a moving charge, which would be a current, a moving charge, uh, in fact induces a B field. And again, we talked about this in the last, the last chapter, electromagnetic waves. You kind of have to be careful when you talk about a moving charge. If it's moving uniformly, meaning a constant current, it's traveling with a constant speed. If it's a constant speed, then, then the change in the electric field is a constant. So if the right hand side of this is a constant, um, then you're going to get a constant B field. Now, interestingly, if you have a non-uniform current, meaning it's a current that's increasing, 
Um, like something is powering up, you know, like when you turn on a generator or you turn on an electromagnet or you turn on a big piece of equipment, it takes some time to power up. So the current coming out uh, keeps changing. Uh, then it's a non-uniformly changing current. And then, then you get that sort of coupled nature and then you're going to get electromagnetic uh, interference because it will generate electromagnetic waves. Interestingly, actually, if you've heard of um, uh, NMR, NMR is a, a very interesting branch of, well, I mean, you can call it physics. It's mostly used in chemistry, um, uh, nuclear magnetic resonance. And what they do is they take um, electromagnetic radiation and they blast it at the nucleus of, you know, atoms and molecules. And um, they, they study pretty much the induced currents, uh, uh, or they call it the footprint, of, of, these, of these molecules. And every molecule will react in a different way. So they pretty much map, they, they shoot electromagnetic radiation at these molecules and they sort of map uh, the response. And you know, if they do this with a bunch of known molecules, and say, okay, yep, this is molecule one, shoot it, read it, figure out what its footprint is, log it in a book. And then when they're doing tests and experiments in the lab, and they're trying to confirm what products they have, um, then what they're able to do is putting an unknown sample in, blast it, see its footprints, and cross-reference it with what they, what they know the footprints look like. And, um, but these, the, the, the NMR machines are, are the way they generate and blast these, these uh, electromagnetic waves at these molecules is they do it with an electromagnet. They've got these giant, giant, giant coils and they pump a huge amount of current through these, these coils and it generates this B field which can interact with the molecules. But the thing is, there's so much current that you can't just, you know, flip a switch. You can't just turn it on and it goes from zero current to, to, you know, like 20 amps or it's way more than 20 amps of current, but you know, you can't just flip a switch and then, you know, go from zero current to maximum current um, over, you know, it takes time to sort of build up. And uh, there's so much current pumping through these wires that they get it ridiculously hot. They've got to cool them with liquid nitrogen, sometimes even liquid helium, very expensive to run. And then there's a back EMF because there's self-induction going on. And uh, so, yeah, the, the current is, is, is changing with time as you power up this NMR machine. So actually, when they power up the NMR machine, um, you, you actually get electromagnetic interference in the room. You know, your cell phone will stop working. The screen of your cell phone might flicker. The lights might flicker. Um, other electronic devices might flicker. Um, they can actually demagnetize credit cards if your wallet is in your pocket and you're standing sort of too close. Um, if you've got your laptop in your bag and your laptop usually is, has a, a, a hard drive, um, if you have your laptop in your bag and you flip on the NMR machine and your laptop bag is happening to be too close to the NMR machine, it'll actually wipe your laptop in the blink of an eye. So um, very cool physics that goes on there as well behind the scenes. Anyway. I digress a little bit. So Ampere's law says um, a current will induce a magnetic field. And we were able to use Ampere's law in the same way we use Gauss's law that when we, when we had a current and we wanted to figure out the associated magnetic field, we used Ampere's law to find B, and then we were able to use QVB to find the force. Um, so here we are with QVB. I jumped the gun a little bit. There's QVB. Um, we talked about the, the path of a charged particle, a moving charged particle in a magnetic field. So um, if you have a, a, a charged particle in uh, an electric field, it will just move linearly because the force is just a repulsive force or an attractive force. So it just, it's a linear acceleration. But with um, the cross product QV cross B, then we actually get circular motion when you have a charged particle moving in a B field. So um, it's a little bit trickier to think about and analyze, but as long as you remember that you get a circular path, then when you study this, the dynamics of this, you're going to get F net equals MV squared over R instead of just a simple F net equals MA. Uh, we were also able to look at the force on a wire. So we started with QVB and we were able to end up with ILB. It's pretty much the same equation. You're just kind of moving the division by T underneath a different variable. Uh, this was our first sort of exposure to right hand rules. So we have three right hand rules. Um, to predict um, various things in this chapter so far. 
So you can get the thumbs up right hand rule uh, where you grab, oops, where you grab the wire and you want to figure out kind of the B field that's generated from the current in the wire. You can use the thumbs up right hand rule. And if you want to know the direction of the force on a moving particle, you've got two options for that. You've got the give me money, flat handout, give me money, right hand rule, or you have the physics gangster sign, right hand rule. Again, where thumb is thrust, uh, index finger is current, middle finger is magnetic field. Uh, we then moved on to using Ampere's law to solving for some B fields. So for instance, in a coil, um, by the way, this is a throwback to your midterm question. Um, the midterm question had two plates of current. I think the bottom plate had current into the page and the top plate perhaps had current or uh, yeah, out of the page. And um, we asked you to find the B field in this location, the B field in this location, and the B field in this location. And that was uh, supposed to be a throwback to a solenoid because if you look at the cross section of a solenoid, it's in fact the exact same setup. You have a string of current along the bottom that goes into the page. You have a string of current at the top that comes out of the page. It's exactly the same setup. So the way you would do the question on the midterm is it could have been as simple as this is the same as a solenoid and then just stating, stating this, come on, why is it not writing? There you go, stating this uh, as your final answer. Um, or you could have derived it. Um, I, you should have derived it actually. I mean, you would have gotten partial credit uh, if you said it was the same as a solenoid, but ideally you should have shown it. You should have shown that, you know, you've got no, no B field lines outside. So, you know, there's no B field contributing from the outside. So the, that sum goes to zero. Um, and then it's, it's really the inside um, part here that that is the important part. So the answer to the midterm question is below the, the, the plates, B field is zero, above the plates, B field is zero. And in between the plates, the B field is mu naught n i over l. Uh, moving on, the last of Maxwell's equations was Faraday's law. And Faraday's law said that when you have a changing B field or, or more specifically a changing flux, um, there you can get a, a, an E field as a result of that. And uh, changing flux, there's a few ways you can change the flux, right? The flux here we have B, we have A, and we have theta. And changing each of these has its own unique applications. So it's really hard, in practice, it's really hard to change the B field um, because if you're generating the B field with a magnet, it's really hard to change the strength of the B field of a magnet because it's a magnet. Um, with the area, it's really hard to change, uh, continuously change with time um, the area of a loop. I mean, you, you can do it a little bit, but I mean, it's, it's really hard to sort of change the area of a loop continuously with time. So theta, manipulating the theta variable is actually very advantageous because the theta variable, we can just rotate. And this is how we come up with generators and DC motors, is we just take a loop of wire inside of a magnetic, a constant magnetic field, and we can just rotate that loop of wire, and that's still manipulating the changing flux. So we can still take advantage of Faraday's law that way. Um, Lenz's law we talked about. Lenz's law is actually the negative sign within Faraday's law. So Lenz's law says that the, the current that you induce or, or the induced EMF, um, one's a voltage, one's a current, but I mean, if you have a complete circuit, the voltage will in turn produce a current. Um, Lenz's law says that the EMF slash current that you get, that you induce, is going to oppose the change. That's what the negative sign means. The negative sign means you're going to oppose the change. The change meaning the derivative, right? Look at the derivative rate of change. The negative means you are taking the negative of the rate of change. So if the rate of change of flux is positive, then the negative of the rate of change of flux will be negative. So Lenz's law says you're going to oppose the change in flux. Uh, then we moved on to talking about, uh, this is actually the premise of a generator. Um, this is sort of a rail gun, so to speak, but it's pretty much the premise of a generator where you have a B field and uh, a, a closed loop of wire. And when you drag, when you change the A, 
you can induce a current. Now there's multiple ways to induce a current. You know, with a, an actual generator, you're changing theta, but another way to do it is you could change A. That would be something like a rail gun. This was also um, partly on your, on your test, I believe. Um, was it? No, it wasn't. It wasn't on your test, actually. Uh, oh, it sort of was. It was, um, it was uh, the short answer question where the magnet was going up and down uh, in a coil. So Faraday's law was, was definitely on there, but as, as one of the short answer problems. Uh, then we talked about generators. Again, we're still about the flux, how to, how to manipulate the flux. And with a generator, it's all about changing the theta, and then you can get a current that way. Uh, one of the last topics we talked about in um, Faraday's law or in electrodynamics was um, transformers, where you can have a step up or a step down transformer, and it's a way in which we can manipulate the current and voltage, and and uh, you know we, it's how we our electricity grid works. Quite frankly, um, you know we have AC current along these these power lines. And it's a very low current power line, but it's a very, 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 very high voltage. So, um, you know, high voltage, as you know, with, with um, um, the breakdown voltage, uh, it, it can arc quite far. So the power lines have to be far away from one another because if the two power lines were close to one another, they would arc and spark between the wires themselves. Um, but they're also high up off the ground and away from buildings because, because of, of such, the high, such a high voltage, then it can it can actually arc or spark to to uh, you know a nearby building or God forbid a person. So um, you know the voltage has to be because of the voltage is so high. The wires have to be up 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 and far away for safety. And uh, once they get to our neighborhoods, uh, the voltage is stepped down using a step down transformer. That's what those green boxes are in and around your neighborhood. And then that brings the voltage from hundreds of thousands of volts. Um, down to 120 volts using using those big green transformer boxes. Um, then the very last thing we talked about was mutual inductance. And again, this is using Faraday's law and the same premise as transformers. Um, just remember with the transformer, we had, we had a primary coil that had a current in it. And we had uh, an iron We had an iron core that a solid iron core and then we had a secondary coil that has an induced current and the purpose of this iron core was to ensure ensure 100 percent or, or close to 100 percent um, flux transmission so that whatever changing flux the primary causes is felt perfectly by the secondary. Um, mutual inductance is sort of an unidealized case of a, of a step up or step down transformer. Here with mutual inductance, it's the same idea, but we don't have the iron core. So um, the flux, the, the changing flux in, uh, that, the, that the primary causes is not necessarily perfectly felt by the secondary. So this is where you have less than 100% flux uh, transmission. And um, there are so many factors that go into, you know, is it 90% transmission, 50%? I mean, it's like distance between the coils, um, orientation of the coils, is the co are the coils facing each other as they are in this diagram? Are they facing sideways? Um, there's so many factors that go into this that there really is no formula to come up with this. Um, we just kind of lump it into a variable, we call it M, the mutual inductance coefficient, and it's, ex it's usually experimentally um, determined. So you set up an experiment and you, know, you can measure the current in this, you can measure the current in that, and you can kind of reverse engineer uh, what M is using these equations. And once you have M, then, you know, then you can go on and do some other math and useful things as well. So pretty much, I guess what I'm saying is mutual inductance is, is, a, is a more of a realistic transformer.
you know, an, a transformer is an idealistic thing. A lot of work goes into making a very good transformer. Uh, a lot of work goes into making the iron core. A lot of work goes into making sure that the flux is transmitted perfectly. All that takes money and time and energy. And mutual inductance is just simply a non, uh, a non idealistic case of that. Okay. Uh, and then we have self inductance, of course, because the changing flux from the primary is also felt by the primary. So Lenz's law kicks in again, and you get that sort of um, self induced back EMF. So that's a sort of uh, a very quick rundown on the, the first part of the course that maybe wasn't so uh, recent. Um, you know, optics and wave nature and EM radiation, those are all more, more uh, recent. So hopefully those are, are fresher in your head. So um, this was just a sort of a rundown of the beginning part of the course that may have been kind of forgotten because it's been a while. Okay, so that's the course review uh, in a rundown. Uh, I'm going to stop the recording now and then I'm going to just take, take student questions for the rest of the lecture. So thanks for coming out. And that was the official last part of the recorded lecture was the course was the course review and the exam review. So um, congratulations, guys, you finally made it to the actually last part of the of the lecture, which was the review. So I hope you had a good course. And if you're watching on YouTube, um, good luck on the exam. And you can always go back to YouTube and, and watch these videos at any time in case you need them for the future. Okay, guys. Uh, I guess ciao permanently. Ciao. Bye, guys.